Thank you very much for this introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I want to thank my friend Philip Lalayer and Saeed Murphy and their team for organizing this wonderful conference and bringing all of us here. It's a pleasure and honor for me to be here. As you can see from the title of my talk, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the aspects of the interaction of light with matter and how to structure light using uh, media that have higher degrees of freedom. Of spatial distribution and world variations, or even other form of degrees of freedom, like isotropy, like non periodicity and so on and so forth. As uh, Isabel mentioned, this is the end of better part. You know, we all love better surfaces. And in the context of better surface, what we have important is interaction of the wave with the interface. Now, in that context, uh, oh, let's put this one in there. Slideshow. Oh. Okay. Uh, in that context, uh, I like the quote by Herb Cromer at the Nobel Laureate in 2000. As you know, he won the Nobel Prize for his discovery in the And in his uh, Nobel lecture in December of 2000, and he mentioned this that the interface is a device. So uh, that's actually quite fascinating. In other words, most of the interest in physics actually happens at the interface. And in our community, the surface indeed represents that interesting interaction of wave with surface. Speaking of that, by the way, there's another interesting quote in the system of physics by Wolfgang Pauli, who said that God made the ball, but the surface was invented by the reader. So uh, we always deal with surfaces, and it's interesting to see how we can harvest them. Now, in my group, we are interested in looking at some of these metasurfaces in different contexts, some of them relate to our interests in symphonic analog computation, some of them relate to the uh, issue of near zero index photonics, and other times it relates to the four dimensional metamaterial in which the material parameters of the time, in addition to being variation in space. But in the interest of time, I'm going to concentrate on three topics over here, if time permits. So let's start with the first one. The first one is the concept of metasurface photonic computing machines. Why are we interested in this? What are we doing there over here and what we can do? The basic golden idea of the following. Imagine that you have metasurface that you'd like to design with a collection of elements that I'm showing you. And you can show you these elements the non periodic fashion. So then the question one would ask is that what should the location of this element, the shape of this element, and the material of this element be in order to have the following properties? Now, what properties we are looking for? That if you have a way to come to the structure as a function of space and time, as the wave interacts with this element, you can talk to the others, obviously the shape. Of that way, we different the other side. And the goal is to actually it's a bit structured that the relationship between the output and input be the transfer function you like. So, in a sense, what we would like to do is to do you know mathematical operations of your interest and your kernel using the circle. Now, this falls within the category of optical signal processing, of course, as you all know. Signal processing is a long history in fact several decades. Here I'm showing some of the examples you know, back in 1970, the book of SHLE, Shire Feynman, or here has been a lot of time very poor in optical signal processing and in neural network and also volume photograph. Nikolai Yildiz has done this beautiful work over here, Sherry Zan, and others, and indeed you can see back on the other things work very nice for and uh, Martin Sobiti, Peter Stark there, and also Jose Zana and, uh, and Mark Chetla for a while has done great work. But what we are interested in the community of bed materials and surfaces is to actually work with the surface structure, prefer with much thinner structure with respect to wavelength, and try to do uh, analog computation. Back in 2014, uh, together with Andrew and Vincent the came up with this suggestion is that can we design a metal material that as you send the wave to it, can do mathematical operations. And indeed, in 2014, we suggested two recipes in doing so for that. 
For example, you can design the material that can take differentiation, can take integration, confusion. Then in 2019, we wrote in a much more ambitious world. We said, okay, now that we know how to design better materials that can do mathematical operation, can we design a better material with certain effects and solve equations we'd like? To? And in 2019, in this conference that was held in Lisbon, I showed you our results at that. And now today, I would like to show you what we have done since then in this context. But first, let me show you what we had in 2019. In 2019, we wanted to actually solve this third form integral equation of the second kind, in which you know i is a new function, k is a kernel, and the goal is to solve this equation to find the function g. Can we do that with light using better surfaces? And indeed, we showed that theoretically and experimentally. So in our experiment, we chose this kernel, which is a general kernel in the form of it is non-separable, it is not shift invariant, and it is complex. And we use inverse design, and we came up with this structure for our experiment design that indeed represents that kernel of that integral equation with the proper feedback that we have waveguides. And then we studied this, we did a series of you know, theoretical and numerical simulations, this one of the simulations that you see over here. And after we were convinced that this should work, we built the system. And this is a photograph of the system that I showed back in 2019 in this conference. And what you see over here is indeed our experimental result as compared with the theoretical result and with the numerical simulation. So what you see over here is that the red curve, there are three of them represents the real part of experimental result, theoretical result that you expect for the solution of that equation, and the full risk simulation. One represents the imagination for the different inputs. So, indeed, we show that we can actually solve that integral equation for that kernel with the arbitrary input. That encouraged us, by the way, later on to see what we can do with the structure and to actually put our goal in the more ambitious form. So, we said now that we showed that we can actually do this with one structure, can we actually design one single structure? That can solve more than one integral equation at the same time. Can we actually do parallel analog processing for that? And indeed, that was also the case. So we went back to our original idea over here. And this time, when we use the inverse design to find this inhomogeneous distribution of the permittivity over here, the goal was actually a more constrained goal. We had to make sure that when we operate with this omega one. It gives us the kernel K1. But the same structure, when you operate it with the frequency of omega 2, is going to give you a different kernel, even though it's a single structure. Inverse design gave us that. And we did that. And we built this structure for these two different kernels. This is a sketch of the structure. And the feedback system is underneath of this. We actually required an interesting engineering to make sure that for two different frequencies, we get exactly the wrong trick system that we want. This is a photograph of the system we built. And these are the experimental results compared with the theoretical and numerical simulation. When you operate it with a frequency 4 gigahertz, without the frequency we did in our experiment, it solves the integral equation with the kernel K1. Again, the real part shown by, by, the, uh, by the solid curve and the imaginary part by the dash curve. And you see all three during the experiment. And simulation agreed well, both real and imaginary part system. The same structure when you operate with the five gigahertz signal, it solves a different integral equation for different inputs for that different target. So this encouraged us to see okay, what direction we can take this for. Now these were in the microwave system we did. So we decided to bring it into the digital and near infrared. So currently, we are working in, in collaboration with my colleague, Dave Stor, in our department, previous opportunity, to actually bring this idea into silicon photonics, in the platform of silicon photonics. So here, we built two systems. One, the two by two kernel over here. And what you see over here is simulation of the system we built. Just to give an idea, this is about 11 micron by 11 micron system. And the, the dark area is the silicon photonic structure that is aged to about 150 nanometer. 
And the white region is a silicon complex with 220 nanometer in it. So it's a, it's a silicon buried inside SiO2 in a different edges. So this is a simulation that you see over here. And we did also for another kernel, in this case, three by three kernel, we built it there. And uh, this was built, and in the lab, this was tested just next door to our office, and indeed, it did well to what we have here. Now, this does not solve the equation. This is for vector matrix multiplication. There is no feedback here yet. That's the part of this. Yes. So that's one direction we are taking this because if we can bring this into silicon technology, then in that we can actually use that the technology to make this a further work. Another direction we are taking this is in collaboration with Albert Coleman and Emma and then go and with Kimi. We wanted to do this in an open optics. So far, what I've been showing you is the wavelength system that takes it there. But what if we go to the open optics to design a metal surface over here? But in order to have a feedback, you put this semi-transparent mirror over here, and when the light comes over here, bouncing back and forth between that metal surface and that semi-infinite mirror, it gives you the feedback you want. And this system can solve the integral equation as well. This structure was built in Albert's lab and tested there in the structure that you see there. And indeed, it showed that we can solve that equation there. Our paper came out in nature and nanotechnology in January. But in April, we were very happy to see that it made the cover page of the April issue. And I particularly like the caption that the editor put there, mathematics at the speed of light. So indeed, this shows that we can actually solve equations in this. Now you might say, okay, this is interesting. But so far, what we have shown is the kernel that was five by five, three by three, two by two. Can we have a larger kernel? Could we have a kernel that would be 100 by 100? So we are working on that concept right now. So one interesting point just to show you that it is possible to design using inverse design the larger kernel. So for example, here we have designed a kernel that is 10 by 10. Now we haven't built this. This is just the simulation and design so far. But just notice that this is about 30 micron by about 35 micron over here. And in terms of the wavelength of the glided wave in that silicon photonic structure, it's about 55 times the glided wavelength that we have there. Again, this design is based on silicon photonics platform. In other words, you have a layer of 220 nanometers of silicon buried inside the SiO2. And in the region that you see the different white region, those are the region that the H has gone down 70 nanometers down. So it's a comparison of 220 to 100. So it shows that indeed it's possible to inverse design this, but we haven't built this to see you know, how good it works. We've compared it with different models, and the comparison is promising over here. But again, there's no experiment on this yet. But then we said, okay, what are the other possibility of larger kernel we can use? That could be this. So at this point, we decided to actually look at some of the useful kernels. And one category of kernel that you're all familiar with is called banded matrices. But what are those? Imagine that you have a matrix like this, that the size of it could be as large as you want. But the property it has is that you notice that the elements around the diagonal and the neighbor of the diagonal are similar over here. But this is actually a very interesting category of kernels because it actually shows the non-local connection of the system, meaning that every input is connected to the neighboring point, and depending on how far in the neighboring point you go, that that band of the diagonal term becomes larger and larger. Now, this kernel actually is quite interesting because the size of this would be anything you want, because the structure that you need to actually design is only that part and you can repeat it. In other words, the structure would be something like this that we have designed over here. In other words, if you take a look at this, every section that you see over here, inverse design gives us these variations that you see over here. But after you design this, you can just repeat it as many as you want. And that will give you actually that banded matrix you want. This is particularly useful for the non-local uh, metasurface structure. So the structure is periodic, but the fields are not. And you see what I mean by that. So let me show you one example. Imagine you would like to design this kernel 
which is as large as you want, but with this banded proper, that you would like the diagonal term to be zero, neighboring diagonal term, 90 degree phase difference, the other one with zero phase difference over here. And we have been able to design this using the inverse design. So you notice, by the way, if our inverse design, as it gets to the final structure, what happens to the output when you decide one of these waveguides? So you notice eventually it gets to what you want. This waveguide comes over here, but it doesn't couple with the, with the front waveguide. So that represents the diagonal term to zero, but then it couples to the neighboring waveguides with the 90 degree phase difference that we have there. And when you do that, you can actually put them next to each other as, as long as you want. So you can have a very interesting category of the large kernel, but banded one. That you have there. What good does it do? Can we use that in imaging? Yes. So let's try example two, wavelength transform, which is very useful to transform in image processing. So we ask ourselves, can we actually design this standard matrix for the wavelength transform? And indeed, we have designed it. We haven't built this yet. This is just a design for now. So, but it's a silicon platform model. So it can be implemented later on. But the model shows that you can have, for example, this uh, red region that you see over here, is the silicon thickness of 220 nanometer. The green region is silicon region of 150 nanometer. So it's just like proper aging, you can get this one. And, uh, and you notice what happens in this simulation. You send a wave over here, it connects to the neighboring output, so it's a non-local properties. But in each waveguide, you have two modes. Intentionally, we design it that way. The mode number one represents the wave that transform mode one, and the mode number two represents the next, I mean, wavelength transfer number two. So what happens is that if you have an arbitrary image you put it over here, at the bottom waveguide, you can go and read the magnitude and phase of mode ones. That will give you how much wavelength, wavelength number one you have in that content. And you, so it's, a, it's in a sense, you can the wavelength transform all at once that you have in this structure. So let's take a look at one example. So in this simulation, if it's about 31, I mean, unit of this to be next to each other, if your input function to these waveguides is input to be like this, you notice that intentionally you give this function example that it becomes higher high rate that you go over here. So what we expect is the wavelength number one would be higher amplitude over here, and wavelength number two would be lower. As we go from the left to right, the number two increases and number one increases. So essentially, you can actually do the wavelength transfer directly over here. This is not the lens system. This is entirely the metal surface system. This is just few tens of, uh, I mean, micron that you have there. So one of the river, one of the things we started in 2019 is how to design the surface that solve the equation. Now we bring that goal back in the form of the large kernel of banded matrix. Now that we know how to actually design banded matrix, can we solve the equations? So let's bring back that goal again. And the answer is yes, and we show this, you know, in our uh, theoretical form, we decided to use the well-known Helmholtz equation that we all love and use to see how we can actually solve that. So as a result, we designed a system over here, this kernel, is a banded matrix kernel represents the operator of Helmholtz equation, essentially the second order derivative, which is a non local kernel over here. But because we need to have a feedback system in order to solve the equation, we need to have a mirror. So we designed this system as our mirror, and we connect these two together. Which the main, oh, the Helmholtz equation is one. The help of equation one only function of z, and uh, just to show the, the, the system over here. But you see over here, what you have is this would be your input, and then you're going to see what happens over here. So you have this kernel over here, you have this mirror over here, and you come over here, the dark, and you actually excite this, and that will solve the equation for you. This, of course, for one d for z, but of course, this structure that you have is over here. And see, you can actually get the standing wave that you have over here by exciting two sides of the system. So, so we see that this large kernel we can do it this way. But up to now, 
when we made this thing or design this thing, the system set. How do we make it recoverable? Can we actually change this? Now, solve this equation, you're not, you're not even going to change it further. So in order to do that, we looked at the different platform that we have and looked at the platform of Mark Zender interferometer. Now, David Miller from Stanford, uh, back in 2013, proposed a very interesting idea. He said that if we get the collection of Mark Zender interferometer, which consists of two coupled waveguides and two phase shifts there in each one of them, and put them next to each other, you can actually imitate any linear optics. And that's very interesting. So we said, okay, inspired by David's idea, I said, what would happen if we combine David's idea with our idea of solving the equation using the feedback? In that case, can we solve the equation? Yes, we can. But one interesting advantage of this is that you can change it because you can change the state. So first, we studied this in this theoretical work, and we showed that you can actually solve this differential equation with the non constant coefficient. So back to you, there was this one, the equation that we had is like this, and in that case, it was the help of the situation version of this. Okay. So it's function of one variable, but our system, the two systems. So uh, in this theoretical world, we came up with this matrix of 11 by 11, and we showed, depending on how you design this kernel, and this is this, that 11 by 11 matrix that you have, you can solve Hermit equation, you can solve Helmholtz equation and you can solve Mayer equation. Obviously, of course, we are familiar with those equations. We don't need to find the solution to scratch. But this was actually helping us to see how our system works for the known equation for comparison set. But we can put you know, any non constant coefficient uh, differential equation to over here. And then we decided to build this system. We decided to build this system in electronic version. In other words, to have, you know, Electronic uh, the, the, the circuit elements to imitate the Mark Zender interferometer for 45 meters just to see you know how we can actually change it. So in this structure that we build over here, thanks to my postdoc at that time, uh, who is now working in metal material company Athens, uh, so we put this system together, it consists of 25 of this coupler for a five by five matrix. And uh, then there is this feedback system that comes over here. You don't see the photograph the system over here. So this system has this feedback that you have over here, and it can actually solve the equation. And it can invert the matrix. So one of the interesting points about this system is that it can invert the matrix. That's true. That's what actually we showed in our other system that we have there. But this has one extra advantage, is that you can actually change the curve. So when you solve the equation and find the inverse of the kernel, then you can go and change the kernel and find its inverse again. Then you can go change the kernel, find its inverse again. So in, in a sense, you bring the, the degree of freedom of time over here as well. So here, symbolically, we are showing this, that you can actually change your kernel as a function of time. Each time, you can find its inverse. And that here we show some experimental results comparing with the theoretical results. We started first with the kernel, and this is you know 25 complex number in the complex domain, and the red one is the experiment, and the blue one is the exact or the or the target matrix that we wanted. And you see agreement is very good. And we did that for 100 uh, different you know kernel. And here we put the feedback back and try to actually find the inverse. Of this one, and here we show you one example of that over here. So the inverse works out quite nicely. But what good does it do? Okay, so you have a system that can invert the matrix and solve the equation, but it can also change. Now, if that's the case, we can actually use that in quite a series of interesting problems. I'm going to show you two examples that over here. One example is the root find, Newton's method in root find. So we said what would happen if we have this, I mean, complex binomial and we try to find its root. And of course, you're all familiar that you can do it with the Jacobian matrix and you have to actually invert that matrix. And every time you invert that, you can actually put a new value of Z into the system. So every time you put a new value of system, you find a new Jacobian, then you have to invert it to find the next value of Z. So that's one of the things. You need to invert the matrix, but the matrix changes. So this system can be useful for that. And we applied to this, and indeed, experimentally, we showed 
that if we start from this point, actually over a series of iteration, we're going to get the complex five complex numbers that you're looking for. And here is the comparison between the experiment and numerical for the inverse of the two. So we are very excited about this. And let me show you the example number two. Example number two, we decide to say, okay, can this structure actually design the structure? Now we are all familiar with inverse design, the very powerful method that you can actually use inverse design to find the distribution of the, uh, I mean, permittivity. Well, that's an optimization problem. But because the system can invert the matrix and can actually also compute itself, can it actually do the inverse design? We are at the early stage of this, but we just showed this example that works. So imagine that you have five scatterers over here, and you have an incident wave coming like this, and obviously it is scattered, and you would like at least four points, you would like to have specific value of a scattered field. The question is, what should those five dielectric constants be? That's an inverse design problem. That's an inverse scattering problem. Can our gadget actually solve this? And to find those five epsilons? Yes, it did. It actually solved it and find the spiders. So this actually quite nicely connects to what uh, my friend, so he's like a part of it, with his idea of physics is not computation, does it optimization. And indeed, here, the physics of the wave that goes through the system, and of course, the system is also computable, it actually converges toward the solution that we are looking for. So indeed, we take advantage of physics, as Eli was mentioning, to actually solve this inverse problem. How much time do I have? Okay, great, thank you. So just in the remaining two minutes that I have, I'd like to switch gears. And this is the third topic I wanted to tell you about, and it's very brief. And yesterday, and God was very shocked to do this job showing what aspects of time and material. And indeed, he showed that one of the interesting duality symmetry is in the spatial interface. And the temporal interface is this relation. In the spatial interface, as he said, frequency stay conserved, but not the momentum. In the temporal interface, momentum state itself, but not frequency. Now, we have done various different you know, uh, topics in these aspects of that, and I presented it in the previous meeting. In fact, in 2021, this meeting, I showed some of the results at that time, so I'm not going to repeat that. But what I'm going to show over here is the work that you're currently doing, which is work in progress. And that's this idea of could we have temporal constraints and temporal wiring? Now, you're all familiar with the concept of electronics that started from condensed matter with having you know, two, two D material on top of each other. And then with the twisting one with respect to the other one, you have a very interesting variation of electron transfer. Yeah. Now, in year 2020, and draw a little bit, see that the two uh, together, they did this beautiful board that brings this idea into the photonic aspects, they said. So in their work, they said they can have a photonic magic angle in twisted by data. So what they did, theoretically and experimentally in their work, they did monotonic oxide. They put it on top of each other. And monotonic oxide, by the way, is a hyperbolic material, which means if you actually write it in terms of epsilon of x, x, and epsilon of y, y, one of those epsilon is negative, the other one is positive, and you're working linear with hyperbolic medium. And what they showed, by the way, in the board is that if this twist angle is zero, you get this equal frequency in hyperbola that we're all familiar with that. But as you start changing the angle between these two layers, the equal frequency of the dispersion will change. For example, at this angle, 30 degrees still is hyperbolic. At 70 degrees, it's getting close to this, and then 80 degrees is not elliptical. So the dispersion changes quite nicely. So I was inspired by doing what they were and then we asked ourselves this question. Do we have a temporal equivalent of this? Now, what do I mean by that? So imagine that you have an unbounded medium, which is hyperbolic medium, whose epsilon x is positive and epsilon y y is negative. And this is the cross of the equifrequency of this manifold of the dispersion that they're all familiar with that. And of course, if you have a wave, plane wave propagation of this, you can easily find the wave. 
But not the direction that you have a plane where you copy it. And I'm trying to hear to teach now. You rapidly change this medium to what? To another type of body medium, very similar to this, except the axis you go to. Is this a temporal equivalent of the spikes? Indeed, it is. And you're going to see what interesting picture you get. So, in this case, you temporally change it, that medium to this medium while the remote is going there. And we have to make sure that wave number K stays conserved. So, what happens, of course, first you have to calculate this, and this is straightforward. And then what happens if you compare with their world? In their world, the frequency was the same, all of these, and they were looking for variation of K as part of the of incidence. In our world, K is still the same, but you're looking for variation of omega of that. How much frequency conversion do we get from omega one to omega two? So let me show you some uh, results and then I stop. So let's start, for example, with this hyperbolic medium. By the way, you notice that this is only two dimension. The z axis, you don't have any electric field around it. That's the so imagine this is your hyperbolic medium, but then first you don't shift it at all. So you stay like this, so nothing is happening. So obviously, the relation between omega 2 with respect to omega 1 is certainly 1. So there is a frequency conversion, but of course, the amplitude is what we expect. But now imagine you actually do this temporal variation only for the angle of two degrees. So I want you to remember this one, this circle of omega two with respect to omega one. And you notice what happened, we just make the angle two degrees. So this anisotropic epsilon turns into this anisotropic epsilon with an off diagonal term. And then let's see what happens to the frequency conversion. So this is the plot of polar plots of omega two with respect to omega one. And you see huge variation of frequency you can find. You can find frequency that is very, very high. You can find frequency that is very, very low in this aspect of what happened. By the way, in our assumption so far, we are assuming no dispersion of the density. By my white one, we are working dispersion of the So what would happen if we increase that angle to 15 degrees? The system with a significantly different frequency conversion. So this frequency conversion is very much dependent on our direction. And that will give you a huge variation between this. Now, the interesting point about this huge variation actually can be intuitively explained. In the hyperbolic medium, if you have a way of propagating the direction, of course, the passive part of the hyperbolic is very large. Now, when you rapidly change that, to another hyperbolic medium, it has to preserve that k. But if it's not towards the passive part anymore, that means you have to jump the frequency in order to get that. So that's what a huge frequency variation happens over here. And that is required to establish that over here. Because the very huge frequency modulation system, 45 degrees and eventually 90 degrees. I don't have time to go through the reason of see this yellow curve. This yellow curve is between top imaginary frequency. And those are in the duration of forbidden band of the hyperbolic. So in that case, we don't have propagation there. Then as a result, your omega can be imagined. So let me thank uh, all the members of my group and collaborators here. And uh, in summary, degrees of freedom, as we all know, is quite interesting and important in the structure of life. And in this talk, I showed you a few examples of how we can use the non periodicity in inverse design in order to do you know, equation solving and do photonic computations. How we can bring the time into the reconfigurability of the kernel in inverting the matrix. And how we can bring the time in the four dimensional optics, particularly in the context of the twisted temporal response that we have there. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention.